Hi class. This presentation gives you a little bit of backstory about my relationship with the work of Andre Debuse. It is entitled My Journey with Andre, How I Came to Write a Book on Andre Debuse. And you can see on the left the subject and on the right another author in a much, much, much earlier incarnation. Guess what year that was? Well, I'm not going to tell you, but I will say this. If, if you can read the little years on the, the tassel, then you're doing much better than I. Uh, yeah, so this is me from my high school graduation day. Just kidding. You may recognize me from various incarnations. Starting on the right hand, the earlier days. I think this hat was from like 2011. And then we have 2013 in the middle. Or was it? Yeah. And then 2014 on the left. I'm afraid that that's probably one of the more recent pictures of me. So what's up with the title? I don't know how many of you have seen this obscure film, My Dinner with Andre. But it was worth mentioning. Basically, what's distinctive about this film is that it's just two people talking. That's it. Everything is carried by the wit of the conversation. As you can see by the blurb, it's based mostly on the conversation between Wallace Shawn, who plays himself, and Andrew Andre uh, Gregory, who is a director. And basically, that was a film that I watched in... Oh, I don't know. In the 90s, I didn't even find out about it till then. And it was the weirdest thing we've ever seen. It's been parodied on several different uh, shows, including The Simpsons and Saturday Night Live. So who was Andre Debus? Well, most of you already know who he is because you've read some of his fiction and you've seen the preliminary PowerPoint that I presented on uh, the other day. Basically, he's hailed as one of the most prolific and acclaimed American short story writers of the late 20th century, and all of these other inf all this other information you already know. Um, I don't know if you were aware of this, but his son Andre Debus III's memoir Townie hit number four on the New York Times bestseller list. Now, the reason I mentioned that is it's very difficult for me to talk about my journey with Andre without talking also about my journey with Andre III. This is a very good blurb. Um, while his stories would eventually earn him fellowships from the Guggenheim and Mackenhouse. MacArthur Foundations, uh, as well as the Penn Malamud Award, the Rhea Award for the Short Story, and the Gene Stein Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and nominations for a National Books Critics Circle Award, and a Pulitzer Prize, Debus struggled to find a foothold in a publishing world dominated by novels. So basically, this is the statement uh, from a uh, Joshua Bodwell. And by the way, I believe I've seen Joshua Bodwell's writing in other pieces as well. And I believe he was one of the folks that came to the debut symposium in 2010, which I'll talk about later. A writer's writer. The accident. Well, I mentioned this very briefly in class. It didn't give you much details, but basically he, Debus was um, traveling from Massachusetts, returning to his home, and basically he stopped to help a stranded motorist it was a car that had run over a motorcycle. Uh, the Lou San Diego and her brother uh, basically were in trouble. He was able to save the lives of Lou's, but unfortunately not her brother. And basically uh, what happened is that he was hit as he shoved her out of the way. The oncoming car uh, that... Um, was barreling into the back of the vehicle stopped in the left lane, hit and killed her brother, and hit him or pinned him at the knees and catapulted him over the roof of the car. Uh, he was conscious, actually, for most of the aftermath, and then, of course, he ended up in the hospital where he nearly died from the bone marrow that had invaded his bloodstream and was traveling to his lungs. Everyone thought that he was for sure going to pass, but by some miracle it stopped by the morning. 
So we had him for another uh, few years, another 13 years, in which he wrote 17 stories, basically that answered earlier themes and also that featured characters with disabilities. Well, in short, I have summarized his literary output. Because we've already covered this, I'm going to skip it a little bit, but I do want to focus on this one piece here. Um, I do have a book. That's what this PowerPoint presentation is about. And it focuses on mainly those stories and essays contained in Broken Vessels, Meditations, and Dancing After Hours, which of course all occurred after the accident. All right, I wanted to bring this one up to your attention. Um, this is, let's see, this is Judd Apatow. Uh, and he wrote The 40-Year-Old Virgin and Knocked Up. Now, this is just one of many celebrities who I've heard mention uh, the um, work of Andre Debuse. Whom do you consider the best writers, etc.? I am the last person you should ask because I don't read that much. My buying to actually reading ratio is 387 to 1. He's a, he, by the way, he's a comedy writer. I buy a ton of books. I have actually convinced myself that buying books is the same as reading. Some of the writers I return to are Andre Debuse Jr. and the third. By the junior, of course, he means um, Andre Debuse. And I should at this point explain that Andre Debuse had a father by the name of Andre Debuse. And then he, of course, had a son, Andre Jules Debuse, which is, of course, the current subject. And then Andre named his son Andre Debuse III. It's a little confusing. Uh, you can mention some of these other names, by the way, that Judd Apatow mentions are people that I've read. Uh, Lori Moore, for instance, has written a wonderful short story called How to Become a Writer. But she's also written, um, she came on scene in 1985 with a collection of short stories called Self-Help, Self and they were written in the second person. All right, so here he is as a child, and here he is right there. Isn't he cute? And we have on the bottom left, that's Elizabeth Debuse, and on the right, that's Catherine and his father, Andre. As you know from the previous PowerPoint, he grew up in Louisiana, joined the Marine Corps, and as soon as his father passed away, he resigned from the Marine Corps and went to the University of Iowa, where he earned an MFA and then taught at Bradford College for quite some years. Um, as many academics, especially writers who go to universities to for an academic position. They travel quite a bit. Uh, again, he was married three times, and the first and the third marriages, uh, he had children, and then, of course, he died in 1999, which was unfortunate because he was only 62 years old. Interestingly enough, he spoke to Todd Field, the director of In the Bedroom, the day before he died. He was very excited about the adaptation. In fact, he had plans to go to California, and Todd said that he would uh, get a, uh, a crane to lift his wheelchair up so he can actually have a bird's eye view of the scene that were being filmed. He did, was able to speak to other members of his family as well, Andre and Suzanne, his eldest daughter. This is an overview of the fiction. I wanted to give you a little bit of insight into what you're going to be reading, what you are currently reading, placing it in his canon. Uh, this particular book, Separate Flights, is this is a, a, a snapshot of a title page. And the anecdote behind this is that this is actually a book I, I got through Link Plus from Occidental, and I'll never forget it. This was about four or five years ago, maybe six. And I was shocked because it was an autographed copy they were circulating. So, of course, I wrote them back and I, I emailed the uh, librarian. And I said, you should not be circulating this book. The fee for replacing a library book at that time was $125. I was seriously, evilly attempted to claim it as lost and keep it. It would have been my only autographed copy. 
but that was ethically not so good. And I didn't think I could do that. Well, this is a slide you've seen before, so I won't spend a long time on it, but just remember, um, he, and I do think it's very useful to explain the essence of his fiction. And I really do think this also is a major criteria of my aesthetic for fiction, or really, literature in general. As abstract, experimental, weird, and funky as it may be, the most lasting writing has to hit a human being. It has to hit someone who feels. All right, other topics. Well, most of his fiction falls into these categories. Louisiana, stories about growing up, military boot camp. He has a story called Cadence. Massachusetts, most of his short stories, including a father story, take place there. He more or less refers it to, the, to it as the Merrimack River Valley. He has a few stories uh, concerning the Catholic school, the Christian Brothers in Lafayette. And by the way, I actually went to Lafayette and, and drove by his old high school. He actually has some baseball stories. Under the Lights is one of them. And he also has a few that have to do with living in a college town. Townies is a short story that he wrote in before the accident and that's where his son got hit the title for his memoir. Here's a good picture of him. And this is uh, from the 1960s. Uh, Andre Jules de Buse uh, wrote one novel which was opt... Uh, param I'm actually, I'm not sure which studio opted to buy it, but they did buy it. And I do believe it, there was discussion. Um, I think um, Richard Burton came on board and he was going to play the lead role, but apparently it never got produced. And here's a picture of him um, as a member of the Marine Corps. Other themes of the fiction, basically we've talked about the heart, the cycle of sin, suffering, and sacrament, uh, resulting in a pervasive search for communion, whether it be sacred or secular, whether there be any kind of ostensible faith tradition or not, alienation, crime, brokenness, and ethical dilemmas, the world of the family, marriage, adultery, rape, and abortion, and there is a series of rape stories, and we'll get into that in just a moment, and of course parent-child relationships. Now this picture here comes from the archives at Harry Ransom Center. This is a card that he actually sent his father and I believe this may have been the last, if not the last piece of correspondence, then the last, definitely the last Father's Day card his father ever received from him. Oh, yes, and here is Andre Debus III as a teenager with his father. I like this picture. Um, I unfortunately did not get original access to this. This comes from the web. Okay, so pre-accident fiction. Basically, If They Knew Yvonne, Adultery, A Father Story, Voices from the Moon, Killings, which we've read, The Pretty Girl, which we will not read, but is in the great story, and The Fat Girl, which we will read. Interestingly enough, The Pretty Girl is a rape story. Um, the Fat Girl is a unique story in his canon. There's really nothing else like it. Many people find it to be one of their favorites. It's probably the only one that actually has ostensible humor. And of course, this is a uh, the picture is of a edition that came out in the early 2000s with a preface by Todd Field. And basically, Todd went ahead and chose the seven stories he most liked. And uh, the of course, the cover was supposed to go with the release of the film. All right, so post-accident post -accident fiction includes these stories. We will be reading The Curse and Dancing After Hours as well as Sisters. And, of course, uh, this is an illustration from Playboy in which he published The Colonel's Wife. We've seen this picture, and it's significant because, again, this was the first short story composed and published after his accident. And I, I 
got this illustration from Xavier University Special Collections. All right, essays are that are important to the life of, well, basically to not just to the life, but to the understanding of his fiction. Uh, I've listed them here. We will be reading Bastille Day about Catherine carrying sacraments. I don't think we will be reading Song of Pity or On Sharon's Wharf. Now, interestingly enough, On Sharon's Wharf, there is some overlap between Broken Vessels and On Sharon's Wharf. I found that to be abundantly clear when I was in the archives this summer researching the drafts. Here's an illustration of carrying uh, an essay that appears in Meditations from a Movable Chair. It was collected there. You're going to see this photo again. It's very moving. That's, of course, um, Andre Dubus III and his father. All right, well, here's a quotation from Sacraments, and I believe that this was also on the PowerPoint presentation. And again, the idea is that he has a very liberal idea of what the sacraments do and are. Oh, so there's another picture from the past. So where did my book start? Well, would you believe it started way, 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 way long ago when I was a graduate student at USC. What you're looking at, of course, is the day of my graduation with a Ph.D., um, it was um, June of, or May of 1994, were you even alive? Maybe, maybe not. But the point is, I didn't file until December, but I was able to walk in that wonderful audience, uh, sitting alongside, well, actually not sitting because they were too special to sit. Uh, Steven Spielberg received an honor degree, as did Ella Fitzgerald on that very day. Okay, so this is how it all started. In 1989, Debus wrote a reply to a survey that our graduate student class uh, in American literature had sent him. I took three semesters of American literature and history from a professor by the name of J. Martin, who I called the walking encyclopedia. He knew everything about American literature that ever could be known. Uh, he had some very interesting um, experience. He did interview, in person, the famous short story writer and humorist Dorothy Parker. Now, may, some of you may not have heard of her before, but she was one of the original writers of the New Yorker magazine. Uh, and she wrote a number of short humorous verses. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go into all of that, but um, yeah, she, he interviewed Dorothy Parker. So one of the things that he did, and he, he was very, very smart, he had us hang together and write. We were going to write a book, each of us taking a chapter on contemporary short story writers. So to start it off, we sent out these questionnaires to uh, quite a few writers. I can't remember the exact number. I think there was at least um, over 100 of them. Guess what? I was assigned Andre Debuse. <laughs> and from there, I got to study this document. So here's a little expert excerpt from it. Uh, do any aspects of your own biography exert a special influence on your fiction? Being a Catholic and a father. More from that particular document. Um, and this is his writing about his creative process. And uh, I, I don't... How about this? Why don't I pause for a moment and let you read this? And that is when I know the story is complete, he says. He's afraid of the voice of the story will go away from him. And from what I've read and what I found out in the archives from the various special collections around the country, you can tell by the way he signs his drafts with a brief thank you. You can tell that he is almost superstitious about the voice of the story. And that was borne out by some comments that especially his daughter Suzanne made. Andre Debus in the Realms of the Heart. The next stage in this story after 1989 and uh, around the time I was in graduate school 
um, was basically this chapter that I wrote. This chapter you see, this picture here is, <laughs> I still have it. You see the old paper? It's old Mac paper, old Mac computer I had. This is with Jay Martin's editing. He is a very good and thorough editor. I'm sure you've gotten documents back from your professors like this. It was uh, finished in 1995. Unfortunately, that book never was. Um, the person who was running it, the person who was supposed to edit and put it together, we not everybody contributed. I did. I had also a chapter on the short story writer Grace Paley. In 2000 uh, was an interesting year. That was the first CCL I went to. That's the Conference on Christianity and Literature. And it was in Seattle, Washington. And I will never forget it because we had friends there whom we visited and whom you will see. Actually, I don't know if you will see a picture of them, but uh, they were some of the people that came with, uh, came with us to a, a later CCL in um, Canada. So this is an excerpt from this document, which I have on doc sharing. Andre Debus, writer, father, husband, Catholic, and ex-Marine captain, approaches his craft, attempting to shed those aspects of his person and history that threaten to interfere with the stories of his characters. At the same time, confined to a wheelchair since 1986, Debus has his own deeply personal stories to tell. And so this is actually a, an overview of his fiction. So I, I don't know what the final word count or page count is. I think it's around 20, 25 pages, and it was meant to be the chapter of a book on short story writers. Okay, Suffering Rape. All right, let's talk about this a little bit. That's kind of like a odd title and maybe a little shocking to you. It started with my investigation of a series of stories that had to do with a victim being raped. And it was presented at a conference in uh, Canada at Trinity Western University uh, near Langley, B.C. And on that, at that time, here's me at the hotel pool. There's my son. If you can see in the background, it says, Bienvenue. Welcome to Canada. And this conference, the paper that I gave for it, resulted in a publication. And that publication is, was published in 2008. Doing Penance in the Old West, Sisters as Andre Debus's Final Word on Suffering Rape. My thesis is basically the kernel of the thesis for my book. Based on this one article, I started to think along the lines of a bigger project. However, in the end, it is Sisters which most resolves the issues of suffering rape first posed in The Curse. In short, in Northrop Fry's formulation of comedy as completed tragedy and tragedy as unfinished comedy, Sisters is the completed version of the curse and consequently his generically comedic answer to the tragedy of rape. So, in 2009, I took a sabbatical and traveled to, of all places, New Orleans, where I visited Xavier University's Resource Center. At that time, it was the sole location, or not the sole location, but one of the, made, the, the biggest collection of Debus's papers. There were also a few in another location in New Orleans, Loyola. And it wasn't until later that the papers at the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas at Austin were made public. So at this point in time, they were the only place I could get to his papers. Of course, his papers weren't complete. Well, so what else did I do besides hang out in New Orleans? Well, I went to Baton Rouge and interviewed his sister, Catherine DeBuse, a marvelous lady, about whom I will say more in the next slides. I wrote the first draft of the Luann chapter. That would be my chapter one. Now, Luann Arsenault is a character who appears in three or four stories that are published in Dancing After Hours, and at this time I also drafted the outline for my book. I'll give you a secret, or not so secret. The idea for my book came about because of all of my conference papers, many of them with, with maybe like three or four exceptional papers, 
were all about Andre de Buse, and I thought what I could do is take each of these conference papers and actually put together different chapters. And because I was always interested or I saw a common theme running among his, his uh, stories, I was able to pull this all together, which I'll explain when we get to the slides regarding my book. Anyway, uh, I also interviewed Father Al in that semester I was on sabbatical. Now, Father Al, uh, his last name, who I'm, I'm really apologize, I've forgotten. He is no longer at St. Francis of Rome. But do you know that we did, he was from South Africa, Zimbabwe actually, uh, and he was a marvelous uh, man, and I still have a recording of his, of my interview with him, and it was my, one of the earliest uh, stages in my understanding and researching the Catholic faith, and uh, basically that following semester, remember Common Day of Learning? Well, I set up a panel on Catholic and Protestant versions of communion, and I had uh, Father Al come. I invited him to APU, and do you know that was the first time he'd ever been to APU? So he was, he was very impressed. Anyway, I did look up, go on the website for St. Francis of Rome, and, and he's moved on to another church. All right, well, this is one of the pictures that I was able to retrieve from the archives in Xavier University. Uh, as you'll see in other slides, and you've seen already, there's quite a few available in different locations. Ah, Nolens. Now, did you know that Sigma Tau Delta had their conference there a couple of years ago? And I think that may have been one of the best trips. It is a marvelous and fun city with lots of good food. And you can see me here sampling the coffee in the French Quarter. And we also went to a couple of music clubs at night. All right, here she is, Catherine Debuse. Well, I did interview her, and at, at, before my computer was refreshed, I had a number of the files on my computer. Well, guess what? Now I only have the interview of Suzanne Debuse. Uh, but you know what's really good? I have them on CDs. So I have them on CDRs, and I'll be able to recover them, and at some point in time, maybe, if you wish, you may listen to one of these interviews. They really need to be edited, and so I haven't actually put them up yet, and I almost put them in this presentation, but I think it would make the file way too big. So here's an excerpt from Catherine as interview. I asked him, or at least I made a statement. One of the statements I made was, your brother repeatedly said that he saw the world as a Catholic sees it. How do you think that evidenced itself in his life? She said that he wasn't always a Catholic. He was towards the end of his life. He matured into that. She said, I feel the same about taking the daily Mass as he did. You know, more about Catherine, just very briefly. She had, she was the eldest daughter. She was the first to marry. She moved out of the house while um, Debuse was still in high school. And then he went on to uh, McNeese State University and then from there to the Marine Corps. So actually, they did not live together for many, 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 many years. And so she remembers him from the time when he was very young because he didn't go back to Louisiana. Now, he visited on several occasions, and she told me some great stories about when he came back to visit. Uh, but she went on to have, I believe, eight children. And you can imagine, uh, she, at this time, she was 79 years old. And I know that she's still going strong. And the uh, scholar who is writing the biography of Debuse has a lot of correspondence with her as well. So she's very hospitable. Uh, we, we've, I've seen her since this year, 2009, which I'll talk about later. All right. So in 2010, uh, there was a special topics Debuse Symposium in Saint, at St. Anselm University in New Hampshire. I presented two papers on Debuse, both of them the basis for chapters in my book. I met and interviewed Andre Debuse III for the first time, who was the guest speaker there. And again, I know those files. I really think they're somewhere on my computer. <laughs> but you know, I'll find them. <laughs> Uh, I interviewed Suzanne Debuse, who was invited to come to the symposium but couldn't make it. So the day before, um, a couple of days before I went to the symposium, I took um, 
I rented a car, drove up from Boston, went to Newburyport, and visited her at her place of work. Uh, she is the executive director of the Jeannie Geiger Crisis Center, and her story of how she ended up there is very interesting. Uh, Suzanne was raped when she was 18. She was gang raped when she was 18. And, of course, uh, it, it's clear to me, and I'm sure when the biography comes out, it will probably be stated there as well, this is an incredibly influential event for Debuse because he couldn't do anything. He couldn't prevent it. He wasn't there. And so um, his stories about rape, I think, are very influenced by that event. Catherine and I hung out because uh, I had seen, you know, seen her in 2009, so she uh, was invited to come to the symposium and you know, basically share her recollections. This was a gathering. This is one of the best gatherings. This type of gatherings are what you strive to have if you become an academic. If you become interested in a particular subject, writer, or specialty, and you go hang out with your peeps, and you talk about what you have, it's almost as good as a Star Wars convention. I know, believe me, we're not, I would like to think we're not quite so geeky as the Star Wars people, or the Star Trek people, who are even worse, but I will say, oh, don't let me, don't repeat that, please don't repeat that to Tom Parham. Okay, anyway, the point is, it was great fun. So, it wasn't a very big conference, but everyone knew Debuse back and forth. Some of them, some people actually knew him, knew him. Um, and the weirdest thing is, this wasn't planned, but because I was such good friends with Catherine, she muscled me in on the birthday celebration for Elias Debuse, who was having his, like, 12th or 13th birthday party. Elias Debuse is the grandson of Andre Debuse, uh, Andre Debuse III. So, I went to Andre Debuse III's house. For dinner and a big old party afterwards and it was quite an experience uh, I could go on and on about it but I think that's sufficient for now oh yes sorry about the quality of the photo one bad thing I did I did not bring the right technology with me this is taken with my iPod touch so I apologize I have or was it? I also have a few camera phone photos. I have other ones, but they're not quite so good as this, as you can imagine. Oh, and here's a much better picture of Andre, uh, Jeb, and Suzanne. Uh, and I don't know what they're doing, but apparently this is this was captioned um, from the internet as a behind-the-scenes photo. I suppose they were being filmed for a documentary or a video. There is actually uh, a video entitled The Times Are Never So Bad, and it was produced by um, another guest at the symposium, Edward Delaney, and it is a very interesting video. I don't know if I have it in my possession still. It may be that I do. Uh, but it was it was very enlightening. All right, so from that time in 2010, the proceedings of the symposium were published by the Xavier Review Press. And so what you're looking at here is a finished version of my conference paper, Andre Buse's Christian Aesthetic of Disability. Uh, and you can see on the back cover, they have essays by Catherine Debuse, scholarship by me and a few other folks. Edward Gleason, uh, Ross Gresham, who edited a volume of his interviews, and Elizabeth Grubgeld, Neil Dolan, a few others. Uh, I wouldn't expect you to know these people, but again, they... Actually, Elizabeth Grubgeld wasn't even at the uh, symposium, but it's interesting that she wrote a paper on his disability, and, and in some ways, it was on a similar subject and topic as mine, um, but she didn't deal with the idea of a Christian aesthetic. And that also happens in academia. Um, you will find that people f uh, write on similar topics. And, you know, when you're writing a dissertation, your big fear as a graduate student is, oh my gosh, how can I write something original? People have already covered this, right? Well, nothing is ever completely derivative or unoriginal and it's it's a false fear because there's such an emphasis in our culture because of the romantic movement and I know I've said this in my other courses but are we at we have never 
recovered from the romantic notions of originality. We think that everything has to be new, fresh, different. You know, like we, you know, it's horrible if it resembles anything else. So writers will always say things like, oh, I, you know, I've never read that. Or, no, I wasn't influenced by anything. I made it up all up myself. All right, Townie, why do I bring this up? Because, again, uh, once I started work on Andre de Buse and started to meet his family, it was very difficult for me to separate out the different uh, lives that his life touched. Now, of course, in some ways, Andre de Buse III was doing promotion. He's a very friendly and charismatic man, Andre de Buse III. Super charismatic. He is so much, he's not like his dad in some ways, but he's very um, charming, very charming. And he showed up at this conference, and he was very generous with his time. Uh, our interview took place in the cab of his Toyota Tundra as he drove around the parking lot of St. Anselm. Um, we stopped by like an AM, PM while he got a drink, and I sat there in his car. <laughs> and uh, then, as I said, you know, he invited me over to his house afterwards. But he had a hard time with his dad growing up. And so this memoir uh, was very shocking for some people. I took students of English 488 Spring 2011, uh, I think that might have been the second time I taught this course, to a reading by debuts of Townie in Hollywood. And he was there, and after a while, I, I, I didn't say anything during the reading, but as I stood in line, we, when he finally came up to him, he <laughs> came out around, gave me a big hug, and the students are going, what? <laughs> anyway, um, from that point on in 2011, I continued writing other papers having to do with the work of Debuse. I also at this time, and I don't mention it here, uh, I started to branch out on other subjects. Yes, I do care about other things besides Andre Debuse. In fact, this whole thing about aesthetics, Christian aesthetics and aesthetics in general, um, were the subject of a paper I did for a symposium in England, which, at which Mark Eaton was, and of course he ran it, um, and it was on this issue of the secular and this, the, um, the secular age. We had read Charles Taylor's massive 900-page book on the secular age, which argues more or less that the secular age is a myth, that in fact, if we are, we, there isn't an increasing amount of secularity in the world, in the West, since the um, Enlightenment. In fact, what there is, is a proliferation of systems of belief. Anyway, that's another subject. But that, that subject is another one that I'm interested in. All right, moving on. Okay, so the comic move towards redemption in the late writings of Andre de All right, this is, well... This was the original title of my book. I've changed it since then. But it's good enough to go. So let's continue and let me explain what it is. It's not funny. Although, I like this picture. Comic. What I mean by comic is as pertaining to the often redemptive pattern comedy follows in moving towards a restoration, a marriage, a social integration or balance, a festival, a celebration, new life in general. So my thesis is that Debuse's essays in fiction written after the accident in 1986 follow a redemptive pattern. This pattern is most like that identified by the structuralist critic Northrop Frye, that comedy, in order to be comedy, contains and averts a potential tragedy. And in fact, if you think about it, tragedy is simply unfinished comedy. Now, I could go on and on about that, but the, the, the best example I can give you is the Christian story. If Jesus did not rise from the grave, we would have had a tragedy. But instead, he completed and averted the tragedy by his resurrection. Okay, moving on. Debuse as a writer saw the world as a Catholic, as I said, in a cycle of sin, suffering, and sacrament. And as an author and a man, he moved within a comic universe. His later stories pick up and often redeem spiritual and ethical issues within his earlier fiction. He answers some of the problems that he's, he meditated about for many years. Some of his stories 
remain unfinished in the sense that people are left in despair or not quite despair but agony or guilt um, not all of his stories have happy endings so uh, the argument of the of comedy is the major structuralist piece from which I draw part of my thesis and that is well best represented by these quotations divine men do not die they die and rise again the ritual pattern behind the catharsis of comedy is the resurrection that follows the death the epiphany or manifestation of the risen hero little side note here my dissertation was entitled sexual parody in American comedic film and literature now this is on a completely different subject on film and on humorists who wrote in the 20s 30s and 40s but I have never ever recovered from my fascination with with comedy and here it is again and you have to admit and you will see I believe that most of Debussy's stories are not funny <laughs> so in some ways I believe I am writing the second book the first book was my dissertation this is the second book the first book was on comedy this is the serious version but it's not tragic all right Edward Schlielbeck's uh, is a theological source for my book it's a very you know I don't take extensively from Schiel Schlielbeck's Carl Rayner and uh, she try to say this five times fast Schlielbeck's this particular theologian and Carl Rayner founded influenced the modern Catholic Church they were writing in the 60s and so most of the theological premises for the way the Catholic Church is formed can be basically encapsulated or is encapsulated in their work simple quotation major idea in this book we are directing our attention to sacramentality in religion in order to arrive eventually at the insight that the sacraments are the properly human mode of encounter with God another very important and distinguishing strand of my book has to do with rehabilitative medicine and its relationship to disability studies there are two different camps well in my recent times there there they will always be somewhat different the rehabilitative medicine comes from the medical field and uh, Beverly wrote, Wright wrote a book that was very important uh, in dictating the way that people thought about disability in the medical field the acceptance of loss theory that when one loses some capacity or is physically impaired that they need to make an adjustment mentally and spiritually and some of these factors are those that describe it uh, basically to look forward to other things besides running if you lose your legs to enlarge what it means to be alive and to not focus on what you can't do but what you can in some ways it it was perfectly sensible but in other ways it was objected to and I'll explain that here's a picture of, of Andre and I think you saw this in an earlier presentation uh, and on so disability studies the social constructivist take on what and how we need to look at disability there's both the academic study and then there's the activist camp the activist camp are the people who brought about the American Disabilities Act in 1990 and since then or actually before then a few universities house entire schools or departments of disability studies it's a huge and important field and I have just barely started to scratch the surface of it anyway here's some of the ideas the concept of lost stereotypes disabled people as incomplete this stereotyping results in disabled people becoming the repositories of loss we look at them and see a person in a wheelchair as a person who has lost something. 
Social projections cause disabled people psychic costs. While they battle <coughs> not being the stereotype, they lose out on exploring other aspects of their identities. Social projections of loss, acceptance, and denial help manage the destabilizing threat that disabled people have been construed to pose. That they are construed is not evident. It is a self-evident reality of embedded unconscious constructions. All right, what does that mean when it's at home? Simply this. They represent loss. They pose a threat, a psychic threat, to people who believe themselves non-disabled. Uh, that, too, could happen to me. So their personhood, their identity, is subsumed by this disabling process. The bottom line is that whereas acceptance of loss theory in rehabilitative medicine sees disability as something to be overcome on an individual level, or at least in the beginning days, that's how they saw it, disability studies counter that with, guess what? There is no such thing as disability. What it is, is a disabling process that society is at large fosters or puts on individuals who don't meet a norm. Interesting stuff. All right, so here's an example of the kinds of documents that uh, are problematic for the disability studies movement. This profile in Courage, I'm hitting two birds with one stone here. This is a picture of Debuse and his two young daughters, Cadence and Madeline. And this is, of course, when a profile in Courage, isn't he brave? He overcame his obstacle. Unfortunately, there are other books, fortunately or unfortunately, it's a combination of both. There are other more sophisticated takes that combine, and this is my interest, um, disability studies, largely secular and non-faith based, with Christian approaches to disability studies. Uh, the problem is, is that we tend to individualize and we say, oh yes, this is a personal trial that you have to overcome. Um, Disability studies scholars object to that. So in a way, while this tells us about Debuse and his children and gives us a, a better view of who he was as a person towards the end of his life, and in fact, in some ways, the fact that he had to sit still and he couldn't move as much made him sit still and rethink his spirituality and led to all those marvelous essays that we are reading so in some ways, it's hard for us not to construe or construct a narrative that features greater spirituality because of greater disability. All right, I know this is getting a bit long for you guys, so if you want to pause, you can pause this and pick it up again. One, two, three, breathe. Okay, so here we go. Harry Ransom Center. Well, I went there in 2010 for about three days on a little side trip, and I photocopied a bunch of stuff. I got a digitized recorded lecture on a CD, and I was overall impressed and overwhelmed. I said, one day I want to come back when I have more time. Five years later, I made that promise a reality. I got a faculty research grant to pay for my hotel to stay there two weeks. I wish I could have stayed longer. There are actually research fellowships, but I didn't apply for those, and that's another story. But anyway, I was there for a long time, and do you know that technology had changed so radically that the whole system had been, um, well, not digitized. They were still papers, and I had to go in to the reading room and bring just a pad of paper and a pencil, but I brought my iPad, and I was, took hundreds, no, thousands of pictures of the documents, which served as a substitution for all those photocopies and all that paper I had to bring home back in 2010. So, um, basically, in 2015, I took several ha pages of handwritten notes, and this semester I will be typing those up, and from those notes, I will be taking some information, putting it into my book, and some information uh, to develop new articles. Oh, okay. So, oh, this is an awful slide. All right, I'm sorry. Um, I should probably go forward and go back, but, yeah, too much time. So, I want to publish this book. 
or I wanted to. So I wrote to Peter Line. They sent me this back. I sent them this wonderful proposal that I had developed by talking to one of the representatives way back in 2010. Nah, no good. Oh, we like your prospectus, they said, but there's a couple of details you left out. So they sent this to me. I got this last year. Mm, I want to say December 2014. So guess what? I spent all that fall working on revising it. Actually, it was earlier than that. And then, of course, spring happened and I got real busy with teaching. And you know what? I It took me all summer to do this everything that's listed under A. Brief description, outstanding features. I had to research the audience. I had to um, basically predict how long it was going to be. You know, there's so many different things that I had to do. And you know that because it was such a detailed perspective, pr prospectus that I ended up writing the book this summer. All of these four items, including the Vita, had to be updated. So instead of, like, just slapping something off, I went ahead, I did it thoroughly, and this is what happened. Ah! <laughs> All right. And that, too. This is my, my initial reaction to that prospectus. Guideline. Paper. I was in dread over it, but in some ways it was the best thing that happened to me because resulted in this. This is my book. Now, um, rather than read through every single one of these little bullet points, I am going to suggest, again, a moment of silence after I tell you about my title, and let you just skim through, okay, and realize that this PowerPoint presentation you can return to at any time. I will also put the table of contents up on the website. So you can see this is my book. Um, it has a chapter on Luan, a chapter on the father stories, a chapter on suffering rape based on, of course, the sister's article or sister's paper. It has my chapter on disability, which was published in the Xavier Review, and then a conclusion. Now let me explain something to you. Yes. These were conference papers of about 10 to 12 pages originally. 10 to 12 pages does not a chapter make. So my work this summer and last year has everything to do with doing further research and expanding my, my work into full-length chapters. So from this menu you see, I have finished everything but Chapter 2, The Father Stories, it's just a conference paper still, and I've not yet written the conclusion, but I've written everything else. I've converted all of these things into book chapters. Now, there's a few details left out, like I haven't done an index, and I haven't done... Uh, my references are kind of dodgy in Luan cycle, so I need to fix those. So in other words, this is what I produced in combination with having to do the prospectus and with all my previous work, going all the way back to 1989. And this is what happened. Because I was able to, I sent it off on August 8th, and by August 21st, they wanted me to sign a contract. But my deadline is June 1st. Not so yay. So that's what I will be doing this next semester uh, and as well as the spring. Okay, this is my last slide, except for the works cited. Yay! <laughs> now you're really happy, right? Okay, here's the thing. This is Suzanne Debuse and her daughter Allegra. This wonderful little piece summarizes, in some ways, how Suzanne saw her father. Not that she idealized him, and in fact, uh, the subject of our interview had to do with her reaction to a father's story, which wasn't good. She did not see in her father the kind of father that Luke Ripley purported to be. But you can see how she 
explained her father to her only daughter, Allegra. This PowerPoint lecture has gone really long, so I'm not going to go into details about what Suzanne said. But Allegra is very special. She was a IVF baby, and Suzanne waited a very long time to get pregnant, and I believe she was four months pregnant or five months pregnant when her father died. And Allegra comes from, that name comes from Andre. Her father told her what to name her daughter, or made the suggestion. Interesting, huh? So, thanks for bearing with me. Uh, here are some of my sites. Um, there may be more. <laughs> um, I'll see you guys. Thanks.